welcome back to For Field to Plate, the podcast. We are still here at SHOT Show, and we're doing that What's New at SHOT Show. We are in the Big Frig booth. I'm here with Johnny and Brock. How are you guys doing at the show so far? Good? Doing great. Amazing. Great. It's been a great show. So. so one thing we're doing is walking around to just friends that we have, uh, partners that we have, and just what's new for SHOT Show, what's coming out in 2023, kind of who you guys are as a company, and like where you guys see your future this whole new year. Because I know coming out of COVID, a lot of companies are just like, gung-ho we're like screw it we're, we're gonna go as powerful as we want so kind of tell a little bit about who you are company and kind of what's new for people that are out there um and you know what they can look forward to with big frig which is coolers cups and everything in between so yeah do you want me to go or you want to go ahead johnny i would say you go ahead right. and kick it off talk I, a little bit about you know yeah who we tell are, a little bit about, about who we are where we came from we're based out of south dakota if you can't tell from the accent yeah <laughs> the uh the people are like is that a canadian or minnesotan wisconsin but yeah actually, south, uh, canada light yeah <laughs> canada light so the, the town actually has raised on is on the cheyenne indian reservation so it's a little bit of that probably and then the south dakota accent and so that's where we're based out of and we um started Late 2015, I have another uh, business that's in the medical field, and we wanted to get some custom logo drinkware at the time and uh, checked around, and we tested some samples from, from some manufacturers. And But the problem was I had to order 5,000 uh, tumblers. Oh, right. Well, we didn't. We only needed about 1,000. So anyway, about 1,000, we brought them in, sent them out to our, our clients from Solo Step, and they um, fell in love with them. So they were like, where did you get these? So said, well, we're sitting on some. I know a laser guy in town. He'll do it for you. So that's kind of how this all started back in the day. Um, now we, after a couple months of doing that, like, well, maybe we're on to something. Maybe we'll buy our own laser machine and get some of our tumblers, some tumblers designed specifically yeah. with our mold. And so now six six years later, something that just kind of wasn't planned turned into to what it was. But I think really what we based the whole business around is relationships. Yeah. And, you know, it's... For us, it's more valuable building the relationships with guys and gals and people and companies like you and that have similar views and similar. You yeah, know. well, I think I mean we've <clears throat> talked already. We, we've talked on the phone, but I think that's what drew me towards you guys was that handwritten note, you know, in in the package. Yeah. Well, you know, I got a I got a tumbler for NWTF's 50th anniversary, um, and I was like, I was like, oh man, it felt good. It didn't feel like some of the cheaper ones that they would send out from companies. Yeah. But I opened it up and I opened up the cup and there was a handwritten note in the cup. Yeah. And that's just something you don't see from companies. And that's why I was like, dude, I got to send them an email. I got to just say thanks for, thanks for that. Because I'm the same way. It's like every shirt I sell, every hat, it's like I handwrite a note to thank these people uh -huh. because it's, I don't know, it's, there's, there's something special about and being that, that's a That's a cool, great part about our business. And that's a great part about shot is that we get to work with all these great partners. Yeah. And so we've been really fortunate in that we've, for some really great relationships with some great people and this is a this is an awesome time of year when we get to meet up with those people oh yeah it's a really hectic time but so now you guys are doing drinkware which there's if you're you're not at shop because you're probably not but there's tons of drinkware out here there's also a bunch of coolers so what kind of transition from the the cup to the cooler and like the name and stuff where did you guys like how did that all marry into itself so back to the original story we uh got several thousands of these. I only needed a thousand to, to use for my initial customers at Soul Step. So we had a local uh, home show in Sioux City, Iowa. So we're like, well, we got to get sell the rest of these 4,000 tumblers that we had bought. Yeah. Uh, so we set up, uh, we're like, oh, there's a home show in two weeks in, here in Sioux City. Why don't we get a booth there and we'll, we'll just sell the tumblers there and we'll be good yeah. to go. Yeah, just make your money back. Yeah, and so the, mar the marketing kid that uh, that was a soul step at the time. We're like, well, we got to think of a name. We got to do a banner. And so we thought of some names and then we checked. The domain was taken. And then we were sitting around the table. And I still remember we had tumblers and I sat one down. Of course, this is probably another South Dakota slang. I was like, this is a big friggin' cup. <laughs> and then everybody kind of looks like, hey, how about big frig? And so he we went and like, yeah, that domain's available. And of course so it is because who in their mind thinks of like, <laughs> yeah. And it's funny too, because when I first saw it, my wife, you know, we we're talking. My wife's like, "Oh, big fridge? But no, fridge isn't spelled like that. Fridge should have a D." Yeah. And I was like, "I go, I think it's like friggin' cup." Like, it's so. amazing how many people's brains autocorrect it to fridge. Yeah. Well, because you think like coolers, tumbler, you think yeah. cold, yeah. cold or warm, right? And that's where that it whole idea comes from. Took me about a year going around to shows. We go to you know some 
retail shows and people come up like, where do you plug that thing in at? <laughs> oh, where because they were, they were thinking fridge. Yeah, I'm thinking, how is this, this is the cooler? Like, I don't know any coolers that plug in. Why are you asking that question? But every show, I'd have three, four people ask me. Then I pieced it together after about our fifth show. Like, oh, they think it's a fridge. Big fridge, not big frigs. So, so yeah. what what's new coming out for you guys in you know 2023? What are you guys really kind of focusing on? Where can people... You know, I know I'm looking around, there's amazing custom logos, which I know a lot of coolers aren't, companies aren't doing. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, oh, go get this one. It's going to cost you 500 bucks and it's just a freaking cooler. But these look amazing with people's logo. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of biased on the From Field to Plate logo. I think it's the best one out of everybody's. It is. It's pretty but, cool. Uh, but Super cool. Yeah. So like kind of what's next for you guys? What's that next step? What's that next big thing? I mean, so I, I would say as far as products go, um, this, we've tried some products and we've kind of s- sampled in some of those other arenas that are sort of in adjacent uh, product categories, you yeah. know, like soft-sided coolers or whatever. And we get a lot of questions about that stuff. But I think over the last, like you were talking about during COVID and stuff like that, what it's kind of forced us to do is to just reset and refocus on things we're good at, things we know we're good at, instead of trying to always try to reach and yeah. do something else. Mm-hmm. Um, so I would say we've just taken a uh, kind of a reset approach to just forming better relationships and doing better things with our current products. So um, we have, we will continue to kind of uh, experiment with some right. of those things, but I would say for 23, we're just going to refocus on, you know, good relationships and making sure that we're delivering value to those other partners. Yeah, yeah so, getting, getting back to the core of it all. Yeah, yeah and just keeping it sim- simple. That's one of our uh, our core values. Just keep simple, it simple. Stupid. and <laughs> Simple, stupid, as my dad always says. Yeah, we just don't want to, we don't want to get to the point where we got all kinds of products and, and it gets it's kind of blurry and messy yeah. and it's so, just so what's different about your coolers for people that are going to go going to go online and look than the other let's just say throw out any other Rotomo cooler out there like what's what what, what stands out with your guys as compared to some of these other ones so yeah I mean I think anyone who's at like a similar price point to us has a great product right. so Every, everyone out there has great things, so it then comes down to like taste. Like, what things do you like? It's so, like a, a one big differentiator would be like the latches. So right. you're a guy that uh, you know has a bunch of gear, is always moving stuff around. Um, the latches are really easy to operate, so we got away from those the T style latches that a lot of people use. Um, so one weird thing that people don't really think about is those protrude. Right. So those mm-hmm. create a surface that is not a flat plane. Whereas ours have like a flat plane if you're packing it around gear, um, things like that. Another thing is that they're they're, they're actually metal, um, and they they stay put a little bit better, so they're a little bit more durable, and you can you can really operate it with with one hand. Um, we've also got the the integrated uh, bottle block openers. plates, bottle openers on every cooler, so you oh, never oh, have yeah. to look for one of those. Um, Which also the bottle openers, if you think about it, they also act as for locking, right? Yeah. So, so technically, can, that's their function is a right, lock plate. Right. Yeah, but it's sort of like you get the sandals. Okay. And you're like, oh, look, I got the sandals, but I can pop a beer with the back yeah. too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and then, you know, Brock's, you guys can't see this, but Brock's holding, like, the basket and the cutting board divider. So, one big differentiator is that's all standard equipment for us. So, oh, awesome. a lot you know, of the other competitive stuff comes, you can get it, but it's another 40, 50 cost. bucks or whatever. Right. Um, so that all comes standard on all of our stuff because we found it's better to just just do it right the first time right. than to try to you know nickel and dime people and, and just do it that way. Probably I- my fa- my favorite feature, I guess, is the handles. A lot of coolers they kind of have a floating handle. Right, that r- and rolls around when you yeah, pick it up. This stays there. It's nice and firm. It does. It's not going to pinch your hand or anything. Um, and then you can also take the handles off. Yeah, you, so you, you see a lot of guys with like handles, side by sides. They want to take the handles off. And then strap it down. Run your straps through here. So instead of having something permanently that's in the way, <laughs> it's very modular that way. That's awesome. Then we also have a tracking system on the side, so you can, you know, GoPros or rod holders, or there's different attachments that. Oh, which will is awesome. Because so. you're thinking about like we're sitting on the boat fishing. Yeah. And you're always like, where do I freaking put this? Like yep. to think about actually, or like, for me, I'm a big kayak fisher because we live in Southern California, so we're always out on the ocean, yeah. kayaking, and. I have a cooler on the back for when you catch mm-hmm. fish, but I, you know, drilled. Yeah, you have your little GoPro there. Yeah, and you sit I, well, there. no, but like I drilled rod holders into the rotomold oh, cooler because okay. I'm like, it takes yeah. up the whole back part of your kayak where you're freaking fishing. So to be able to have something where you can actually go on. And, and speaking of fishing, we got the we got the integrated ruler right oh, that's there on awesome. top too. So that's that's every size 
um, except our very smallest one, which is 10 quarts. Yeah. So there's just not enough real estate on that one. Right, for what, like to six inches? It, yeah, <laughs> a, a, a ruler, really? but that's all integrated in there. Um, and then, you know, our thing is custom and creating right. custom solutions for people. So mm-hmm. we can do custom Pantones, like that orange one that you're looking at right there. That was just kind of like a, a one-off deal that we did for a customer. Right. Um, so we have our standard colorways, but um, that's really what, what where we excel, I feel like, is just saying, oh, I don't know, somebody comes to us with something, we say, no, we don't do that, but we'll figure out how. Right. Yeah. Which is sort of like <laughs> me and what I do. Someone comes to me and says, hey, how do I cook this? I have no idea, but, but give it a try. Give me a give me a day and I'll figure it out. You know, I was actually talking to a, a booth over here today, and this guy comes over to me. I was just walking around. He's like, "Hey, you're that from Field of Plate guy." And I was like, "Yes, sir." He goes, "I got a question for you. I shot a Bobcat, and it tastes like shit. How do I make it taste better?" <laughs> and I was like, "Well, first of all, the question is, what did you do? Because <laughs> yeah. it's sort it's sort of like you know, well, letting the dirt right, throw like, it in the fire like, directly. Or I can't I can't correct a mistake until." I understand what the mistake is. And yeah. I feel bad saying that, like, well, how'd you cook it, idiot? You know, like, yeah. and so I was like, well, what'd you do? He's like, oh, well, you know, I was watching another, I'm not going to say the guy's name, but another chef, and he sliced it off, he threw it on the grill. I was like, well, let's stop you right there. First of all, when you have a predator, you need to cook it to a certain temperature to kill off trichinosis, right? And so he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I c- so you cooked it well done over fire, so it became dry and nasty. And also, when you cook it over fire, it enhances its natural essence, right? So if you shoot an antelope, which you guys are from South Dakota, you guys have antelopes oh, yeah. up there. You shoot an antelope, they have a very strong sage flavor to them, right? Yeah. Well, if you were to just season that with salt and pepper, throw it over the fire, what it's going to do is it's going to bring out that sage versus, and a lot of, it turns a lot of people off. It's a very, very strong, pungent, quote-unquote, gamey flavor that a lot yeah. of people do, right? So I'm starting to explain this guy. I was like, okay, well, on my website I have this, and I get it, and, you know, and so then he actually texted me this morning, was like, hey, so I sent it to my wife, and I'm on an airplane heading home, she's putting the, the bobcat thighs into the crock pot right now. So when I get home, I'll have dinner, and I'm going pr- to prove you it's still disgusting. So I'm, like, praying, like, oh, man, I really hope. But, <laughs> but, everyone, but everyone eats the barbacoa recipe. It's a barbacoa, bobcat barbacoa. And I go, it's, it's a no-brainer. Because, again, thinking about the product, how can you make it effective and exciting? And you, you take that slow cook, and you put that slow cook in something, it's going to shred with all the, you know, chipotle peppers, the onions, the garlic. The pe- it's just... And then it just yeah. melts in your mouth, and you put it like on a fresh taco shell with some like pico. It's like out of you this world, stop, man. I'm, well, well, I haven't had lunch yet. So yeah, neither have I. I mean, my my buddy went to go get lunch while we we're doing this podcast. <laughs> but no, so I think that's that's really cool. And I'm looking at the latches too. Is as a guy with little kids, those T locks they can't open and they can't close, yeah. right? Like, and I know you guys have you know kids as well. So I'm looking at it just for the fact of like they're not going to be left open when we're yeah. at deer camp. I can't tell you how many times I walk open and that little plastic rubber is open and the, you know it's sitting open six inches because yeah. that's the way the rubber got stacked. And so I think that for me, that's one of the biggest takeaways when I look at these coolers is, like you were saying, is that handle being mm-hmm. harder and easier to use. I mean, a harder material, but easier to use. And also, when I drive to these hunts, I'm packing the back of my trucks. And like you said, I have two coolers in the back. I'm losing yeah. six inches mm-hmm. of space where I came and shove a gun in between those six inches. It's three inches here, three inches here. Yeah. And so I think for that to be able to like stack and and do that sort of thing is huge. Even, so. even with the latches, for me, and that's when we designed this cooler. I mean, we all. I've used coolers since I was a kid. Like I said, grew up in South Dakota, yeah. did a lot of hunting, lived on the ranch, and so. But something even you don't think of all the time. But when you reach over the back, you pick up those T latches. You try to have to get a little force to oh, push yeah, you down. You can't open them. We can't open unless you jump up on the tire. Well, with these, you reach over, you get your two. One finger under it, you flick it, boom, and they, you, you know, you can open up your cooler by yourself. And you can grab, and you can grab your pop. And yeah, grab your pop out versus. Well, like, I know what you. Were, I was gonna say soda, but I had to re- correct myself. <laughs> yeah. That's right. The environment I was talking to, yeah. pop and a and, and a bag of cookies. You know yeah. that you can. <laughs> exactly. But, but so have you ever been up to South Dakota hunting at all? Or? Well, I have been to South Dakota to hunt. We did pheasant and we did oh, okay. um, uh, antelope. We did it on the Indian reservation. Oh, okay. So really? a friend, uh, a friend of mine up there, he. Uh, works with the Indian Reservation to do guiding gotcha. and hunts on there. So he was like, hey, it was during COVID. Uh-huh. He goes, hey, they're not making any money, but they've got all these animals that have to be killed. Yeah. So they want us to go up and shoot friggin' animals. So went up there and took we t- took a couple guys who had never pheasant hunted before. And tell you what, though, I'm a bird hunter at my core. Yeah. Like, I grew up born and raised. I think I tell a little bit, but if it flies, it dies was the motto that I grew up with. Yeah. But the pheasant we had were a lot of planted birds. Okay. Because that's yep. 
again, your guys aren't native birds either. They were introduced, but they yeah. just thrive in that area. Mm -hmm. And so I remember the first rooster I shot in South Dakota where it didn't just have like one single tail feather coming down because it's a cage bird. Like yeah. the back looked like a turkey fan out at me with like all these. And I was just like watching it fly. And the guy's like, you going to shoot that bird? And I was like, <laughs> but watching the tail feathers just bounce as it was flying through, it was just like, to me, it was gorgeous. I was like, I don't, yeah, I'll shoot that bird. <laughs> but it was one of those deals where you got caught up in the moment. And yeah. Yeah. But it's hunting to me is at its core what we need to get back to. And, and I think walking around this show, you see the same thing. You, you see a lot of tactical guys, but at the at the heart of it, we're all gun owners. Yeah. We're all we're all in the same you know the lane, and I think how do we marry that tactical world with the hunting world and really kind of bring it back together? Because it feels very separated at the mm -hmm. moment. So I think I think food is the is the great equalizer. And, and I think just as like dudes, we're all hardwired to have that in us and want that and crave yeah. that that experience. You know, the, conquering the the challenge of, of actually getting, you know, the harvest and all yeah. that. I think that just lives in all of us. And when you kind of, I don't know, I think we're all guilty to a degree of being soft and being in the city sometimes and that oh, kind yeah. of stuff. So it, it just feels like you're satisfying that primal. Right. And I was, I was writing an article for a magazine and we were talking about how the world itself right now is, is, is such a fast food, fast paced, never slow down, never think about it, never get back to your core, never get back to... And I said, hunting to me is the reset. So yeah. my life is go, 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 go. Take the kids to school. Pick up the kids from school. Take them to this practice. Take them to that practice. Come home, make dinner. But when I'm hunting, it's like a, it's the ultimate reset. It's the ultimate, like, slow down. You get the dinner. You know, it's like, it's, I don't know. And that's what I was telling them. I said, a lot of men, I think, will benefit from getting outdoors. Yeah. Because think about most of the guys nowadays, you know, they work in an office. Mm -hmm. They sit there. They sit at their kid's soccer field, and they yeah. maybe get out one Saturday, and then they're you know. But why do you think? Why do you think marriages are failing? It's because men aren't being men, and women aren't allowed to be women. Like I'm not saying women go sit in the kitchen because I my wife's a horrible cook. Like <laughs> I'd be I'd be as skinny as Johnny here if I, my wife was. <laughs> my cooking. wife, on the other hand, is yeah. not a horrible cook. So. I'm not gonna say, but Brock needs to sit down here <laughs> yeah, for a second. He's exactly. getting uh, get my breath. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But I think that's where you need to look at it, too, is allowing men to be men. And, you know, my dad's church is starting a new program for their junior high and high school kids where it's called Boys to Men. And it's where men in the church are leading small group-based things for junior high and senior boys to say, this is what a godly man looks like. This is what a husband looks like. This is what being a man in the business world looks like. This is, like, this is what a man looks like. The world's going to tell you that you could be non-binary. But at the end of the day, I'm sorry, yeah. you were, you were, you're, you're still stamped when you're born what it says you are. Exactly. And how do you get back to the, that basics of who it is? And so that That's one of the things with COVID for me was an eye-opener because I, again, born in a real community, community, had a pretty simple life. You go out and work on the ranch today, come in the evening, everybody always sat around the meal, dinner table, ate dinner. So one, one of the positives of COVID in my mind was it really – Helps slow me slow me down. My family, we weren't running around like you said, the kids' events and yeah. dance and softball. And so we had the time in the afternoons and evenings, like, hey, take my daughters out to the lake, do a little fishing. Where, like you said, sometimes it seems like with the busy world and the life that we all lead, a lot of that just kind of gets lost in the shuffle. Oh, 110%. We were actually, my wife and I were talking about that last week. I said, I miss COVID. Yeah. And she goes, why? I said, because we sat around as a family mm -hmm. and played games at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Didn't have to be to dance. Or we didn't, didn't have, have to, to. My wife, you know, she worked from home, and so she took a lunch. And we all yeah. sat and had lunch together. I said, I miss the forced family time. Yeah. Because now you look at it, and again, it's like the daughters have homework again. So they're at school from, you know, 8.30 to I pick them up at 2.30. They come home, they have an hour worth of homework. And, and then they got practice for yeah. this. And then it's like, you know, well, she... My youngest one's at golf, so it's like I got to take her to golf and sit there for an hour watching her just, you know, putt and at the drive. Which, I, as a dad, I love watching it. Yeah. But I'm looking, going, man, I miss. And then and you get home, and it's like we sit around the dinner table, we eat. And my wife's like, oh, I got to get ready for tomorrow. And the girls are like, oh, I got to. It's like, you know. So we made it a point to like three days a week, it's game night at around the table mm -hmm. after dinner. You choose, you choose. We choose the family, and yeah. it's really in the past. I think we started it in August. And it's like, I think our girls, I have a 13-year-old and a 9-year-old. I think they they crave it. 
Yeah. They crave that attention. We had one of their friends over, and their friend's like, we're going to play a game. Next thing you know, their friend's like, can I come over on Wednesday? Because <laughs> I, I think we should play Clue. I'm like, yeah, invite your friend over for dinner. We can, you know, it's like, but I'm hoping that that little girl will then take it to her parents. But like, can we play Clue tonight around the dinner table? Like, but I think for them, it brings them back to letting them be kids. Yeah. Because we, we force them to be adults. Yeah. I mean, my, my 12-year-old is learning, you know, like calculus in freaking junior high. Like, I learned that in college, and I sucked at it. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it's like they're doing, my 9-year-old's doing pre-algebra in third grade. <clears throat> pre-algebra. Wow. That was, that was something that resonated with me during our first conversation because we were just, during that time, we were just a bunch of dudes who never yeah, you know, hung out. Yeah. And we all, we figured out that all four of us do the sit down, have dinner every yeah. night at Non-negotiable. the table. And that is not like normal. No, not at all. But uh, yeah, that's how we were all raised and that's how right. it just seems like it should be. And that's something that's missing. We, yeah. we were doing home construction on our stairs and we had put a bunch of stuff on the dinner table for like two nights and we weren't even thinking about it I was making dinner we were just kind of sitting on the couch sitting where we could because we were doing work and then my oldest she, she was sitting there and I'm getting dinner ready the third night and I hear like just you know like cups clanging I hear that yeah. I'm like what the frick are they doing I go over there and they had like shoved everything off the table and it was all like piled up on the floor and they're like can we eat at the dinner table tonight <laughs> in my mind it wasn't even I was doing construction and I had put yeah. tools and and they had, like, took everything off that because, and I go, what? They're like, we just, we eat better when we're sitting around the dinner table. We talk. Yeah. And I think it's true because you're forced to look at them. You're, you know, like, take your phones, take your tablets, take your TV, turn it off. Yeah. Sit around that table and converse with your kids and ask them, like, truly, what's going on in your life? And letting them ask you what's going on in your life. My youngest, mom, what went on at work today? Oh, well, so-and-so this. And she's like, oh, can we pray for her? She's freaking nine years old asking to pray on the dinner table. Like, you don't see that in, in our industry. You don't see that as men nowadays at all. Yeah. Like, men are supposed to be the breadwinner. Go out and do your stuff. And, you know, I feel sorry. Like, my brother-in-law, he works, you know, he works. He leaves his house at 630 in the morning, gets home at 630 at night, and he calls himself a weekend dad. You know, and he takes the kids on the weekend. And I go, it's like you guys are divorced. Like, you come home, you're so tired, and sometimes they'll stay till 9 o'clock, and your wife is over it. She's over you, she's over the kids, because she's been with them. She's pregnant, she got, you know, what, what six and four? Just yeah. turned four, and she's, wow. like, over it. So on the weekend, she's like, take the kids, so she can have quiet time. I'm like, you guys are two separate parents. I go, is money really? Your job's really that? We had this conversation at Christmas time. I go, I would quit my job. I mean, I did quit my job. I worked in the restaurant industry. Like, I worked 17-hour days. And I was like, I'm done. You know, I walked away from a ton of money to go. You know, that's kind of a not much of a life either, is it? Because it's a lot of nights, weekends in the restaurant. Oh, I didn't. Your, I, I mean, didn't. I started in the restaurant business when I was 17. I had not done a Mother's Day, a Christmas Eve, an Easter since I was 17 years old. I remember wow. the first time I quit, and it was Easter morning, and I got up at like three o'clock in the morning to get in my mind to get to the restaurant. My wife's like, you don't have to, and I was like. I mean, I can go to Easter service on Sunday morning, like, wow, you know, and then Christmas Eve services and do all this other stuff where I'm like, I can't, you know, Mother's Day, I can go be with my mother on Mother's Day. Cause usually I'm taking care of, you know, 5,000 yeah. and being, you know, high up in the restaurant. It's like you were getting there at three o'clock to make sure the restaurant's set up because you're going to do a million dollars worth of sales. But before lunchtime, you know, you've got a wait list. That's until four o'clock that night because, and then you go to Father's Day. No one wants to show up for Father's Day, which is funny. Mother's Day, they want to go out and eat, and mothers do nothing, which again tells you about the world. Father's Day, the dad. What does your wife do on Father's Day? Buy steaks. Says you can go grill, grill dinner. <laughs> yeah. True or false? True. <laughs> you know. Oh, hey, the kids bought you a tie. Now, great. I don't even have a collared shirt, but I appreciate the tie, <laughs> right? And so it was funny. So for Christmas this year. My little girls were like, Dad, what do you want? What do you want? What do you? I, said, I don't want anything but your love. Like, we're going to spoil your mom rotten. We're going to do spoil. I want nothing but your love. So under the Christmas tree was a giant box. And I was like, what? And two dad love girls. And I was like, I pick it up. And there's like, wait to it. I'm like, what? They're like, we use all of our own money. We used. My wife's like, I have no idea <laughs> when or where they got it or what. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> so I open it up and they literally got like, a piece of wood from the garage and they wrote all our love and they put it in a box and they wrapped it like I hung it up in my garage I'm like this is the best present that any dad could and they were like 
they thought it was a joke, right? But to me, I was like crying. I was like, oh, you love, like <laughs> on a freaking two by four, just written with Sharpie, like all our love. But I think that is where that, you know, that whole family mentality comes in. And that's yeah. instantly when we were talking on the phone was, that's why I said, I said, we got to do something. We got to, we got to hang out. We got to become best friends because I think we all have that same mindset. And yeah, it's just coolers and cups. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, coolers and cups build friendships and build camaraderie and all long other term, stuff. So. Long-term relationships. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that's one thing I'll give Brock a lot of credit for is that's how he, his vision from the beginning has been to build a company, but a family. Yeah. And he cares. He does care about his employees. Uh, doesn't, you know, Yeah. If, if something's happening in their life, you make sure he's, he's there for them to do whatever, but that's like not what you get at most companies. So building yeah. that culture of, you know, not being, not being huge and just being really good at what you do and being really genuine. He's done a great job at that. So. Yeah, we had a saying at the restaurant all the time when servers would come to me just when I was managing, they were just down in the dumpster. I'd go, it's burgers and fries, baby. <laughs> yeah. Go home at the end of the day. It's burgers and fries. And so that's why, you know, it's coolers and cups. Like at the end of the yeah. day, who you are as a person is going to shine way more through than the product at hand. People never remember, you know, if they came in four times for that rib. The rib isn't what they remember. It's the story and the experience around the rib. Yeah. And so I think for, you know, even though it's coolers and cups, it's what was the experience around loading a deer into the cooler? Or what's that experience? You know, like I have that big NWTF 50th tumbler that you guys had. Mm -hmm. And I was actually dropped my daughter off at school and I had a drink in there. And this guy's like, NWTF, that's that Turkey Federation, right? And we start talking. I never met this guy before. Daughters in the same class. And we started talking. He's like, yeah, I really want to get into hunting. I really want it. And I was like, oh, awesome, man. Here's my phone number. Give me your phone. Let's put your, you know, and I'm going to try to take him on his first turkey hunt this year. But it's like, just because a cup had a logo on it, well, and gave the guy confident enough to freaking get excited yeah. about it, you know? Yeah, and, and there are good experiences, like those great memories you create during hunting and all that stuff. But there are the bad ones, too. Yeah, so, like, which more it's, people it's talk about. It's all products, right? Like, it, it can and will fail. Yeah. Things go wrong. Um, but that's another thing that we try to differentiate ourselves. So, like, yeah, we think our products are great, but we think our people and our service is really great. So when something goes wrong, you pick up a phone, you talk to a human being. It's who's not, not who's not in India? It's yeah, not an really airline. Well. Yeah, it's not an airline where you have to screw around for three hours. And, yeah. Um, and, you know, we have a pretty no questions asked, like, way to take care of our customers. What's that's it going to awesome. do to make it right? We don't have, like, strict policies. It's like, all right, here's the situation. Here's the problem. What's going to make you happy? Right. What do we do for that? Um, so we try to personalize the after-the-sale experience, too. Awesome. Well, tell everybody, I know they've been listening to it for a bit now, but tell everybody where they can find you guys, you know, website, social media, okay. you know, how they can place orders, all that good stuff, and then I'll add that all to the show notes at the bottom. But, yeah, tell yeah. us where they can find you. So you can go to www.bigfrig.com is our website. You can purchase all of our plane stuff up there. Um, there's contact, phone number, email. Uh, if you're doing custom stuff, then we ask you just... Give us a call directly. That's more of a one-on-one -on -one email back and forth for logos and stuff. Um, and you can call uh, orders at bigfrig.com. You can email that with your logo, and we'll get send you back a mock-up. You can view it computerized. Can you say mock-up again? Mock-up. Mock-up. <laughs> have a just, bad it, accent. It was just beautiful. It was Minnesota gorgeous. It was like a gorgeous. beautiful Minnesota, South Dakota. You're yeah. right. Canada light. Accent. It was so, gorgeous. So you're gonna have to just start saying digital proof. Yeah, digital <laughs> proof. <yeah>. Digital <laughs> proof. <laughs> so. No, I like the Mac up. It sounds sounds like you know park the car in Harvard Yard or whatever. Yeah. Um, but if, some if anybody's some ever out our way, we're in North Sioux City, South Dakota, right out right across the border from Sioux City, Iowa, or Iowa, Nebraska, South Dakota. All meet. So people are welcome to stop in our facility. We'll give them a tour. Big you know, big freak coolers on, on the them. socials. Big for talk coolers. about whatever they want to talk about. Yeah. <clears throat> Sioux City, Iowa, that's where the um, all of my pastors were from. Really? Yeah. So uh, the Corvers. They're still okay. Corver, Corver still has a church out there. Or I think he just retired. Um, Are those the basketball ones or no? All the basketball okay, ones. Yep. So Kyle Corver. Oh, who, from like Pella? Yeah. Yep. I yeah. grew up near there. Oh, yeah. So I, I grew up with Kyle when they moved here, when they grew up in Paramount until they moved back. Okay. Uh, oh, no way. Out there. So, Are they yeah. still traveling, doing their show thing, or not? Uh, well, y Kyle will still do stuff, and then their grandma just died. We just did her funeral. Grandma and grandpa both just passed okay. away, so we did the funeral out here. So talking all them out there, but yeah, it's just I mean, I was all I know is Iowa because that's all you grew up with all those Dutch Iowa guys who were coming out like 
oh, yeah. preaching at all the Reformed churches <laughs> and having fun. So, well, perfect. Well, I appreciate it, guys. Uh, and we're going to get going on on here. But, yeah, you get, get ready, you guys, to see some really cool coolers on here. But make sure you check them out on all the socials, all online. And I appreciate you guys. Appreciate, appreciate you, man. Time to do it. So until next time, we'll talk to you guys Thanks later. Thanks for having us. Yes, sir.